Okay, uh, Providence and Prophecy, Daniel, um, session number two. Uh, the we're, we're skipping over chapter two for now because um, we're kind of looking at this under those two themes of providence and prophecy. And chapter two uh, really is all about prophecy. And we're kind of taking some of the providence ones first. You know, providence of you know, God managing this world, God, um, God being so active in everything that happens and how that affects us, his people, and how that affects uh, how we think about him and uh, how we can trust in him. Um, it would be pretty tough to trust somebody who just wound up this world like a toy and let it go and then, you know, checked out. Uh, God is certainly not checked out. He is, he is right here with us. He is right here in it. And he cares about every little thing that happens. Um, so to get started today, let's... Uh, uh, let's jump into Daniel chapter three, uh, read a few verses to kind of get us some uh, um, some context. Uh, one of the other nice things is that uh, Daniel chapter three seems to follow pretty closely after Daniel chapter one chronologically. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is still the king. There's still, you know, it's still Babylon. It's still uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, and Daniel, uh, but more, more Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego than Daniel uh, involved here. Uh, so it uh, it kind of ties together nicely with last week. So Daniel chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 1, I will pull up the Bible reading on here if you want to see it, um, or you can do that in your own screen or on your own Bible, whatever you would like to do. So, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and all the peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, um... We'll pause there uh, for just a second. And one of the things that um, that never made sense to me, uh, I mean, really for a, for a long time, that I, I just didn't really get, was this, how, how are these people getting thrown into this fiery furnace? How does that all work? Because um, when I think of a furnace or, or something like that, I'm thinking of something in my basement or, you know, how, how, does, that, how does that actually work? Um, so I just pulled up this picture here that uh, I found online. And a, a teacher that I had in school, um, I think it was at the seminary, explained it this way, that instead of thinking of soldiers being around here and, and kind of chucking them into the furnace like that, because it, it never made sense to me, how, how are they taking these guys? Eventually, they're going to take these guys, they're going to be tied up, they're going to walk them over to the furnace and throw them in and the people throwing them in are going to be killed by the flames, and yet somehow they can still throw them, right? You know, if I'm if I'm throwing a body and I get close enough that I die, the body's going to fall here outside the furnace. Right? That never made sense to me. Um, and so the the teacher that uh, explained it to me said the furnace was probably more those soldiers were up here on the top, taking them and then throwing them down in like so. So you could be up here. The, uh, the the flames, the heat could be rising, kill the guys throwing them in, and then gravity simply does make them fall down into the furnace. Um, so, so that's, maybe I'm just a weirdo who thinks about strange details, um, <laughs> but I thought it was interesting and, and it, it bothered me that I didn't understand. So um, if you were one of those people, now hopefully you understand better too. Um, and then also, you think of a, a statue, uh, 90 cubits tall and all of this stuff. Um, one of our other resources here is uh, statues compared just for fun. Now, this is not very scientific. 
Uh, I, I, I don't math well. Um, and, uh, my goal really isn't to give you a perfect idea of what this was, but I, when I say 90 cubits, most of you just go, right. What, what does that even mean? Right. How does that even work? How do I even visualize that? Right. So what I did is I went on the, uh, the statue of Liberty national park, uh, website and, and found some stats and then thought, all right, do, does this compare? Right. So the Statue of Liberty, gro ground to the tip of the torch. So all the way from these tiny little people down here, you can see those tiny people, to the tip of the torch, that's 305 feet, one inch. 90 cubit, or excuse me, the heel, so right down here, the, the, the feet of the Statue of Liberty, uh, to the top of the head is 111 uh, feet and one inch. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue would have been about 90 feet high would be 60, or what did I say, 60 cubits? Um, let me see. It is, where is that? I mean, image goes 60 cubits high. Yeah, that makes sense. 60 cubits high, 90 feet tall. So you're talking probably from about the toes, maybe to the shoulders of the largest metal statue in the U.S. Um, that they made thousands of years ago. That's pretty impressive. It's a pretty good size statue. Um, so the width of the waist, 35 feet, the width of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, nine feet. So Nebuchadnezzar's statue was a bit more tall and narrow. But the weight of the copper in the, the, the uh, Statue of Liberty, 62,000 pounds, right? 31 tons. Uh, and the thickness of that copper sheeting is three three thirty seconds of an inch, the thickness of two pennies placed together to kind of give you that idea of how thick that metal is. Now, I I kind of doubt that that they made a solid gold statue. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm just being a doubting Thomas, but most um, statues and things like that would be end up being gold plated, would be covered just like the just like the Statue of Liberty isn't solid copper. Um, so let's let's just assume for the sake of argument that the uh, um, the golden statue was also you know, either thin or, or plated or something. And let's say that it was half as thick as the Statue of Liberty just for fun. Um, and it was maybe even just half um, as as heavy, which, again, I don't think makes sense because gold is heavier than copper. But I'm trying to give you the idea of just conservatively thinking. How big was this thing? How, how, how much of a commitment did Nebuchadnezzar make to making this uh, giant statue? So the value of the material today to make the uh, just the copper part of the Statue of Liberty uh, at copper at $4 a pound is $248,000 just in copper. Uh, if you were to take that and take it to the Recycle Center, you would get $248,000 for the Statue of Liberty. I'm thinking you could probably sell it for more on the black market, but that's what they're going to give you at the Recycle Center. Um, the value of material today. If gold today is worth $2,659 per ounce, and it was 31,000 pounds of gold, we're talking about a $1.3 billion statue that he put up. Um, and that's assuming that it's gold-plated and not gold. It's assuming that it's rather thin gold and not thicker. I, I'm, I'm trying to be conservative here, but yeah, getting the idea of this thing is huge. This thing is expensive. Um, this thing is, uh, this thing is over the top. So um, some stuff there Let me get back here. So um, now before we get back into that big idea for today, I don't have to tell any of you that life is crazy and that there are all kinds of things in life that can just come and bowl you over and mess with you. And all of a sudden you were going one direction and your attention and your life and everything just shoo, drags you over here. And, and all of a sudden you're, you, you feel like your life is a mess. Um, and all of a sudden you feel like um, you're, you, you don't even know what to think or do because life has just dragged you away and into a different direction. Um, and I think also we have a tendency to look at people who that never seems to happen to them. 
they seem like no matter what happens in their life, they keep moving forward. They keep they keep focused. They 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 know what to do. They know where to go. Oh, this is a person of principle. They 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 stick to their principles. They know what to do. They know what they're doing. And I think we kind of tend to we tend to admire people like that. Um, and so yeah, we admire people who live their lives not shaken by every situation, but according to predetermined principles. Well, what happens when principles appear to conflict? And is there a principle that rules all others? Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be kind of thrown into a situation where they've got to make some pretty pretty serious decisions, and they got to make them quick. Um, how were they able to do that is kind of the, the big idea for today. And, and uh, how did God's providence make it so that they could do that? But um, first question to, to think about, yeah, a 90-foot-tall golden statue, a massive propaganda campaign to get people to worship it. And, and think about that too. Did you you notice the lists, right? Like, yeah, and, and every instrument in the world band playing a theme song, you know, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, all kinds of music. It it takes a little bit to put a band together, right? It takes a little bit to put every musical instrument you can think of together. Did you notice the other list? The list of all the different government officials. Remember that those all those government officials couldn't just jump in a car, train, or airplane and get to Babylon quick. They had they they were gathered over probably months getting all of these people at this statue, right? So in every instrument in the world band playing a theme song, a death sentence for disobedience. How could all of this possibly be worth it? Especially when you think about how expensive that thing, how it was, how just the massive scale of this project. Um, why did Nebuchadnezzar go through all this expense and trouble? What were his goals? Can you kind of try to put yourself into the mind of a, uh, oh, what? This is probably a uh, 450, 470 <laughs> BC uh, king. What's What's he trying to do? It almost seems like he's trying to brag or show off his God, his 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 king. Wait, wait, I'm losing my track of my track here. It, there, there's definitely some showing off here. Yeah. But what is the showing off intended to do? Impress people. Mm hmm. And impress the people and require their allegiance. Yes. There's the other side, right? Did I, did I just cut somebody off? No. Uh, I was just um, going to say intimidate. Intimidate as well, right? So, so you've got, you've got um, intimidation. You've got, you're trying to impress them. Um, and you're, you're trying to show off. You're trying to, yeah. So all of this, this is a consolidation of power move. Right? Yeah. He, he, is, he is trying to, this is the most powerful man in the world. Um, and and he is not only showing off, that was the one that I missed, he's not only showing off his, his wealth and power and all of that, he is also consolidating it. He's he is wanting to make sure that it is something that that he has, that he can use, that yet yeah, if you have power, you, you not only do you want to use it, but you want to make sure you can use it, right? Um, how often do we see people uh as soon as somebody has power, they, they fear losing it. And so then they need reassurance that they have it. Right. Um, so, yeah, that, that consolidation of, of power and kind of connected with that then, too. Um, let's look at a couple more verses here. Um, uh, verses, yeah, like 12 and 13 and stuff. Let me see if I can do this. Well, that, yeah. Um, so then verse eight at that at this time. Some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. 
They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, can't you just hear the pride of this man? He's got to list all the instruments again. Right? Hmm. When you hear the sound of the, right, he's just so much pride in his heart. Um, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So, um, furious with rage, you know, overreact much. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever, you know, like I, I've overreacted in my life, believe it or not, it, it, it happens. Um, we all do. I've even become furious with rage in my life, right? But I don't know that I've ever become so furious with rage that I'm like, it's time to burn some people, right? I mean, that, that's pretty extreme. Um, so furious with rage, rage. Why does Nebuchadnezzar get so angry? Um, especially because you kind of think about this. If I, you know, were to look into this computer screen and I just I picked somebody, I picked Ken, and I go, Ken, I'm gonna need you to worship me. The response I would expect you to get would be <laughs> that response. That chuckle right there. That's the response <laughs> I would expect, right? Um, <laughs> it, the, the, probably followed by a no, right? Um, th there's there's just you know, understanding this guy. But anyway, so why, why does Nebuchadnezzar get so angry? Does it have something to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego personally? Uh, what might verses 8 and 12 have to say about his anger being about them personally? Um, I'm... This was one that, honestly, I put this in here so that I would remember to talk about it because I found it interesting. Um, the last thing we we heard last week was Nebuchadnezzar promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That was the last thing we heard. And so in my mind, I was like, oh, he must be angry, especially at them, because he just promoted them, and now this is how they, re how they repay him? Um but there's a couple of things that make me think that that's not really it. Um, you look at verse eight. It says that at this time some astrologers came forward uh, and oops uh, and denounced the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, yada yada yada. And then um, verse twelve he says, "But there are some Jews who you set over the affairs of the province of Bab Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, Your Majesty." If it was personal, I don't think that 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 these astrologers would have had to say anything about them other than their names, right? Um, if the more description I give of a person, the less familiar that person is. With, right? It, think of it that way. If I, if I were to say, you know. Oh, you know, I, I was talking to Bob yesterday, and one of you didn't know who Bob was. Um, the more descriptions I have to give of Bob, the less familiar with Bob you are, right? If I say, oh, you know, the 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 guy on the maintenance team, you'd go immediately, oh, that Bob, right, if you're familiar with him. Oh, uh, maintenance team, uh, he plays dart ball, uh, he, uh, I don't know, he, he's he's got he's got a goatee. Um, he, he went from being full-time to being half-time because he was getting close to retirement age a couple of years ago. The longer I go describing, the less familiar you are with Bob, right? Because I have to give you more information. Um, there are some Jews who you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Let me remind you who these people are. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with them personally. I don't know that Nebuchadnezzar really knew them all that much. This is the king of a giant empire. Um, he doesn't remember remember everybody. Um, so why does he get so angry? Uh, another way to think about it. 
So looking at verses 12 to 15, in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, how are these three things related? Nebuchadnezzar, the man, the Babylonian empire, and the gods of Babylon. How are those three things related? So you look at 12 to 15. Nebuchadnezzar, the nation of Babylon, gods of Babylon. How are those th three things related? How about this? Start with Nebuchadnezzar and the gods of Babylon and the gods in general. What level does Nebuchadnezzar think of himself at? See that the last part? Then what God will be able to save you from my hand? Well, he's, he put the, he's the top. He is the top. And he sees himself right at that very same level, right? Also, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, and Babylon. Uh, think back to uh, what was it, Louis the Louis the Fourteenth. He was the 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 really really powerful French king and uh, the the absolute monarch, right? Built Versailles. Um, he once said, uh, "I am the state," as in I am the government, because he was an absolute monarch. He he was that was him. There was no distinction between government and Louis the Fourteenth, right? You look at somebody like Nebuchadnezzar. Is there any distinction between him and the government? No, he is the government. He is yeah. So, just the 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 whole reason that I'm kind of trying to take you through this part is just to go, what kind of pressure cooker are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in? They are in the kind of pressure cooker where you've got a guy who believes himself to be a god, to be on that level, right? Mm -hmm. That has the entire power of the most powerful nation in the world. He considers it his own. There is no distinction between his personal power and the power of this entire nation. And his singular goal right now is to make sure that everyone agrees with him. Everyone looks at him and says, you are all powerful. You are, you are the government. You are at the level of God himself, and we will do whatever you say. That is his entire goal, right? And he believes that so much that he's going to be furious about it when they don't. So, um, that is a situation I've never found myself in. <laughs> uh, it, it's pretty intense. Uh, any any thoughts, questions about about that stuff and about just the the pickle that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are about to be in? All right. Um, this might be a fun one. Uh, maybe we could sidestep the whole furnace thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I try to avoid dying uh, most days. It's it's something that I I, I try to avoid. Um, what reasons, rationalizations could Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have used to avoid the furnace? How could they have gotten themselves out of this thing? They could have worshipped him. They could have just worshipped him and said, "Hey, we're going to do this." And and what 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 Thoughts might they've used to go, it's not that bad. It's okay. It's worth it. Maybe if they thought it was so ridiculous that they really weren't like buying into it, but they would play along. Isn't that an interesting thing? Um the uh 
everybody knows this is this is silly. I'm just I'm just gonna let it skate through, right? Um, that that's yeah yeah. I, I I could see myself thinking that way. If you think of um, one of the easiest ways to to rationalize something is to think of it as uh, if if I do this thing that I shouldn't, then I'll have the opportunity to do something I should later, right? It's really easy to go, I, I, I can, um, if, if, I, if I'm Shadrach, I could be thinking, hey, I have a position where I can, I'm part of the government, I, I can look out for God's people, I can, I can be, a, be useful and be of service and all of these things, all I have to do is play along right now and I can continue to be useful. And wouldn't God want me to continue to be useful? And also, it seems kind of silly to just throw my life away for nothing. Um, God wants me to, to take care of my life, to, to, to not waste it. Um, maybe I should just, you know, I, I should just play along so that I can continue to do good later. Um, the, the rationalization of evil now so I can good later um is a real dangerous one because one is there ever going to be a later we're not guaranteed um and two uh who's to say you're actually going to turn around and do good later you might just stay on the path you've chosen um and get uh can get sticky all right um one more here let's uh yeah, and then, and then we'll get, get some more reading in. Um, the, the question, is this the line for martyrdom? Um, believe it or not, in the early Christian church, uh, there were some people who did try to get in line. That uh, they were like, hey, um, apparently dying for the Christian faith is the thing to do, uh, and I'm going to do it. I, I actually read uh, an account of somebody who, um, he was in court, and this guy literally just raised his hand and said, I am a Christian and I would like to die for my faith. And so the Roman official was like, okay. And that was the end for that guy. Um, are, should we be getting in line? Um, agree or degree, disagree? Martyrdom is a good thing. <laughs> what do you I think, Ken? Yeah, we're sure. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have a death wish. <laughs> I mean, all of Jesus' disciples except John died martyrs' deaths. Seems like the cool thing to do. They didn't line up to do it. <laughs> there it is. They didn't line up to do it. It came to them. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's also something that's just true of persecution in general. Um I think th there are times where people can get into a persecution complex, right? That, uh, ah, um, what, what is my, my identity as a Christian is, is I, I am somebody that the, that the world, you know, pushes down and rejects and all of these things. And, and, um, uh, the, the, the world hates me because I'm a Christian and it's so rough being a Christian and this and that. Well, is some of that true? Sure. But if I'm raising my hand and saying, Hey, I want to be as annoying as I can so that you all hate me. Is that persecution or is that me being a jerk? <laughs> me being a jerk, right? Um, when we when we get to uh, uh, Daniel chapter six, uh, and Daniel ends up in a similar situation, but with lions instead of a fiery furnace, um, we'll see that yeah, Daniel wasn't volunteering for this. Um, Daniel wasn't putting himself out there in a way that was annoying or anything like that. And neither were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't looking for this. Uh, this came to them. Uh, and that's how it's talked about in Scripture, too. Uh, Hebrews 11, uh, when it talks about people who, have, who suffer for the faith. Um, yeah, yes, there are people who, um, you know, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better re resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, sawed in two, killed by the sword, yada, yada, yada. Just all these terrible things that happened to Christians. Um but that 
doesn't mean they went looking for it. Um, and in fact, Jesus himself said, uh, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Um, if you have the option to not have to die for your faith, you should take that option. Um, don't, you know, your life has been given to you as a gift from God. Uh, that is one of the principles that God gives you. That's one of the principles you should live by. Uh, that you, your life, your family, all of it are things that God has given you and you should take care of and protect. Um, that guy who stood up in a Roman court and said, I'm a Christian and I would like to die for my faith. Um, suicide is not God's will. And that's really what that guy was doing. Um, so, yes, is, is martyrdom a good thing? Sure, but it's not something you should go looking for. Um, is 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 suffering persecution of any kind for the for for the um, because of your faith? Is that admirable? Yes. Should you go looking for it? No. Any any thoughts about that? All right. Uh, next, let's let's do a little bit more reading here. Um, starting at verse sixteen. So. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had just said, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand, uh, which is a pretty intimidating thing to hear. Uh, and then uh, verse 16, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. So let's just stick with that for now. Um, next uh, thought, you know, thinking before speaking, analyze the answer that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave in those verses. Pick, pick three component parts, and, and then why did they include all three parts? So looking at these verses, um, yeah, they... they uh, they, you, I think you can divide their answer up into a couple of chunks here, or, or major thoughts. Into defenders. Ta-da! I got to color. I like coloring. So that, that, that first part, yeah, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend you, ourselves for you in this matter. Which is one of the craziest things in the world to say to the most powerful man in the world who's just threatened to kill you in a really, really nasty way. Right? We don't need to defend ourselves. What? Of course you do. No, we don't. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Um, so number one, their first response to King Nebuchadnezzar is what? How, how would you how would you summer summarize the part in green there? King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves. The God we able we serve is able to rest. They weren't intimidated by him. They were not, and why? Because of their trust in God. God. Yeah. Their faith. Right? Yeah. Their trust in God, their faith. First part of their answer, faith, right? Second part. Oh, well, I suppose I should have uh, I should have included this in the faith part because that that definitely is. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. That's a that's a real big faith statement right there, right? But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. What's that part? I'll give you a hint for those of you who. Uh, who pray the Lord's Prayer from time to time. It's one of your petitions. Your will be done. You got it, right? We pray the Lord's Prayer, your will be done. They're saying, our God is able to do this. We even believe that he will do this, but are they insisting that God must do this? Mm -hmm. They're not, right? Which, yeah, there, there, are, there are few greater expressions of faith than your will be done, right? It's one thing to say, I trust you, God, that you can do this. I even trust you that you will. And it's and it's even on another level to say, and if you don't, 
I still trust you. Still trust you. Um, so, faith, your will be done. And then finally, courage. Right, The courage to say, we're not going to do what you told us to do. We're we're going to we're going to not to, um, and to be able to do that in such a calm way, in such a um, non confrontation I mean, it's it's confrontational in that they're saying they're not going to do it, but it's not disrespectful. They're just saying, "Hey, th this is something that we're not going to do," uh, and to be able to have the courage to just simply stand and say, "All right, what's next?" Um, I keep thinking about how bold. young they were again. Didn't you say yeah. they were in their teens? At the um, at, in chapter one, they were in their teens. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're not exactly sure how long after chapter one this is, but they're they are still young men too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think of being a young man and, uh, uh, be, you know, what I was more reckless when I was younger, so... Um, in some ways, maybe that was, uh, God was giving them this test at a time where it was easier. <laughs> yeah. You think in some ways you think, oh, young guys, they got their whole lives ahead of them. Is that the way young guys think? It's not the way I thought. <laughs> um, and they're but, definitely drawing a line in the sand in front of the king. That they they're are. Line. That they are. Um, yeah. certainly, certainly drawing that line and saying, not not taking another step mm -hmm. um and then you know why include those three parts um i guess the one that uh yeah this one obviously they've got to say no right uh and and this one expressing their faith this one i think is really really kind of cool um throughout the whole answer you can see what their priority is right shadrach meshach and abednego their priority is obvious their priority is our god is number one right and our god's reputation is number one and our god's our god's glory is number one to them right and so they're saying our god can save us but they're already thinking ahead. They're already thinking ahead and saying, but he might not save us. And if God doesn't save them, what do Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not want? I know that's a really awkward question, but it, what are they trying to prevent if it happens that they burn up and die? If I'm Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego burn up and die, what am I going to think about their God? Right. Well, he must have been worthless, right? And so right here in the middle, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going, no, our God is so great, our God is so good, our God is so wise, that we trust him even if he doesn't act. Even if he doesn't act, we don't want his reputation damaged. Yeah. Just wow. Right? That they would that they would have the presence of mind, that they would have the uh that that singular focus on that one thing. Say, we don't want God to look bad if we turn into ash. And Pretty they didn't crazy. seem to, and they didn't seem to come across like arrogant like well our god is better than you that type of thing it was right. just a matter of fact it was faith and they wanted him to wanted i mean their heart probably wanted him to come and know the true god certainly and and there's we're, we're going to have some discussion about that topic in in a little bit but just that yeah they they you're right they don't feel a need to to show off, to meet Nebuchadnezzar showing off with more showing off of their own, right? They don't play his game. They just, they stay right at the place where they should be. 
Um, so let's see what's next thought here. Ah, um, uh, number six, what does this mean? Uh, first commandment in the small catechism, Martin Luther wrote, wrote his explanation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. Uh, what does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Yeah, how did the three men display all three, uh, which would have been most important to you if you were in their shoes? Um, yeah, the fear, love, and trust in God above all things. I I look at, uh, I mean, the trust one's easy to see, right? They're trusting God. Uh, the love one is is pretty easy to see. Um, the uh, that 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 God is such a high priority to them. Uh, the fear one, both both in the sense of respect that they they have this high respect for God, um, but also. Uh, I think it's healthy for us to remember that we all have sinful natures and that sinful nature should be terrified of God. And man, it's, it's, it is a good thing that they had such an understanding of who God is and, and how powerful God is that as they, as they stand in front of the most powerful man in the world next to the blazing furnace, they're still more afraid of God. They still recognize God as the, as the the one to be afraid of more than that king, right? Um, so, if you were in their shoes, which which of these three concepts would be rolling through your head as you step as you stood there? Fear, love, trust. There's no wrong I think, answer. <laughs> I think trust. Um, at least you'd be hoping that you could trust God in this case. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a there. There is some wishful thinking on my part too that I hope that I. Number one, I I I, uh, I trust him. 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 Right. Um. Other thought. I don't want to. I don't want to monopolize. Anybody else have a? I think they all have their place. Um, you just keep praying that his, you know that his will will be done. Right. I, just, I mean. Yeah, I, that the, I know that I, yeah, in, in that moment you could be thinking, I need to trust him, I need to trust him, I need to trust him. And as soon as you say, why? Why would I trust him? Well, I love him. Why do I love him? Because he loved me first. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 love part would come in there. And and there would be moments also that my sinful nature would be looking at it and going, it's not worth it. I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid. And my sinful nature would need the hammer of God's law that would just go, no, you know who you should be afraid of. Um, that you know, none of that. So the each one of them would play their part. Each one of them would be needed for the different parts of us um, to be able to, to, to hold on in, in such a, a difficult situation. Um, let's, let's do a little reading here, just to kind of polish out the story a bit more. Um, so, then Nebuchadnezzar, um, verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. Uh, that phrase is kind of scary. Uh, he was already furious with rage, and then his attitude toward them changes even more for the worse. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Um, so, uh, what is the highest principle for a believer, as demonstrated by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Or maybe to, to think about it another way, agree or disagree, the purpose of a Christian is to make disciples. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? What if you do a great job of sharing your faith your entire life and not one person comes to faith through the through the words you speak or the things you do? Are you a failure? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? My friend, the Holy Ghost helps. He's yeah. the one that's good for us. It's who whose purpose is it really to make disciples? The Holy Spirit's job, right? It's God's job. What is our highest purpose as human beings? What are we really here to do? Um, also, some Bible passage hints here. I'm just gonna kind of scroll through this. It's just a whole list. Um, Exodus 14, verse 4. Try to just pick out what is the, the common thread in all of these. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Psalm 86, verse 9, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord, they will bring glory to your name. Uh, John 14, verse 13, uh, Jesus speaking, and I, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, John 15, verse 8, Jesus again, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And then finally, one from the last book, Revelation 14. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who has made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that their greatest, greatest purpose in life, in the world, in everything is to glorify God, which meant it's one of the reasons why they could say your will be done, right? One, like there's two options, right? They're going to get thrown into this blazing furnace and either God's going to save them or God's not going to not. If God does not save them, how is God glorified? Well, how, let's start with the easy one. If God saves them, God's glorified because he just did something really stinking amazing, right? How is God glorified if he does not save them? He's still glorified because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego proclaim their faith. They still demonstrate this is how much we trust this God. This is how good this God is, that it, it is better to give up life than it is to give up this God and everything that he promises. Right? God can still be glorified. It, again, if my purpose was to make disciples and and to, you know, if, if I thought it was my purpose to make people believe, and then and then it doesn't happen, is is God still glorified? Of course He is. 
right? His message has still gone out. It, 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 like even when it's those passages that talked about Pharaoh, did Pharaoh become a believer? No. Was God glorified? Yes. Um, there are all kinds of different ways that when we when we think that our our purpose is something else, um, that we uh, we can end up messing some things up. Um, a little while ago, I heard something that has just rung in my head ever since uh, in, a, in another pastor's sermon. Um, he, he said that our God, our, our job is, 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 to, is not to make things work out. Our job is to do the right thing. It is not to make something work out. Our job is to do the right thing. Um, put your put that kind of thing into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If they thought that their job was to make things work out, well, then they'd be tempted to, to compromise and to, to rationalize and all of these things. No, the right thing for them to do in that moment was to simply say, we, we can't do what you're telling us to do, and we're willing to take the consequences for it, whatever they might be, and we trust our God. And then it's God's job to make it work out. Not my job. His. Um, and, and by, by trusting him to work it out, I glorify him. If it is my job to make it work out, then I'm really just trying to glorify me. So. Any other thoughts about this one? That's a thought that I find comforting to know that we aren't, I don't know, I can't say, I don't know if the word responsible, but just, um, you know, all we can do is show people God and <laughs> let the Holy Ghost take it from there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I just find that so comforting because I always think, well, am I doing it good enough? You know, well, it's not, you just, uh, yeah. And that applies to evangelism things, that applies to, mm -hmm. that applies to me just living my life, that applies, yeah. If it's if it's my job to make it work out, then all the pressure's on me. Yeah. If, if it is if it is my job to trust the God who is actually managing everything, well, then He's going to make it work. I just I don't know why I keep trying to take His job. He's better at it than me. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we just read through a bunch of verses 19 to 27, and they, they tell the story, one of the most amazing and dramatic miracles in the Bible. Um, and and I just, there are so many really, really cool details. And I just wondered what was, what's, what's your favorite as, as you, as you look at that, what, what makes you go, oh, wow. Um, not only did God, no, not only did they not die, I mean, that would be enough, but not only did they not die, but also this. What what's your but also this as you as you look at those verses? The king saw that there was a fourth man in there. Isn't that awesome? That was my wow. It's just goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. And and it it doesn't identify for us exactly who that is. I mean, is that um is that God himself? Is that an angel? Is it all kinds of possibilities, but in the worst moment of their lives, suddenly they 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 get to see that they're not alone, uh, and everybody else gets to see they're not alone. It's beautiful. I hope I didn't just steal your thunder, too. Nope, no, that was good. It, others, what's what's your uh, what uh, what what makes you go wow? I loved the fact that even though he built this massive statue that was billions of dollars and extremely tall and put all this effort into getting the officials and the bands ready at the drop of a hat that nobody should worship any other gods. Like it was that incredible and that moving to him that he just dropped everything he'd just ever done and said, Nope, you're right. That there's there's definitely a a huge impact on Nebuchadnezzar, um, and we'll 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 discuss a little bit more on where where do we actually think he is spiritually. But the, the, there was an amazingly large impact on him. Um, 
and one of the most proud people in the world <laughs> uh, that it just smashed his his hard heart very quickly. Something that I thought about was I wondered what kind of upbringing that um, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had that they had such a strong faith. Um, yeah, because nowadays we raise our children to have that strong faith and it seems like we're having problems with them staying with it. And so I was amazed at their strong faith, just wondering what their background was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than other than royal family of uh, Judah, I don't think we know too much. But um, yeah. it is it is also once again comforting to go back and say yes, we we do the best we can, and then we trust the Holy Spirit with that too. Yeah, that's right. Um, one of my favorites is this one. There was no smell of fire on them. Um. I I I love I love a good hamburger. I, I love them maybe a little bit too much, and uh, I I really love a good charcoal fire in the backyard in the in the Weber, and it does not take long. Yeah, I it's I try so hard to not stink when I come back in the house, and I can't do it. Uh, and and that's a that's a a charcoal fire in a grill cooking literally three hamburgers you know one for me one for my wife and one for my daughter and it's like this is this is not a blazing furnace and i'm certainly not inside of it um and there did not even smell of fire on um god didn't have to do that he didn't have to do that at all um but that 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 god wanted to not only protect them but I mean, in a way, kind of like to, to your comment, Zach, um, you've got this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, who is showing off big time. And God's not afraid to meet him right there and say, oh, seven times hotter, huh? Well, I'll save them anyway. And not only that, but their clothes, their clothes are fine and they don't even stink. They might even smell better than you, gang. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it just blows my mind that... Uh, the, the power that God has and, and God's willingness to just meet him right there and just go after it. And I think he does that daily. We just sometimes don't realize it, right? Yeah. And the, thing, the things he does, you know, just miracles every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder, I wonder how many times I miss things like uh, no smell of smoke. No. Um, here we go. Uh, kind of to your, your comment a little bit there, Zach, uh, 28 and 29. And, and I think it's a it's a good discussion to have. Uh, did did Nebuchadnezzar become a believer? Oops. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. There, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. So, we say, um, agree or disagree, did, uh, did Nebuchadnezzar become a believer? I guess part of that depends on how we define believer, right? Does he believe that the God of Israel is real? Yes. yes. Does he believe that the God of Israel is powerful? Yes. yes. Does he believe that the God of Israel is worthy of worship? Absolutely yes. Does he believe that the God of Israel is the only God and his savior? No. No. There, I think we got to go to an I don't know, right? I mean, what do you think, Ken and Don? You said no pretty quick. Because the way you said it, um, he refers to it that there's that their own God. It just oh, sounds yeah. like that's yeah. their own God. Well, that does that leaves room for your own God, my own God, and everybody else's own God. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Same same thought in your mind, Ken? Yeah. 
Yeah. Besides which, I think if he believed in God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that he wouldn't threaten to cut people up into pieces and burn their houses up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, old habits die hard, Ken. You know, may, <laughs> maybe he's this is this is believer day one. <laughs> Give him a couple of weeks and maybe his life of sanctification will reach a level where he doesn't <laughs> want to cut people in pieces anymore. Um, yeah, I, I was just talking to uh, my confirmation class and I remember um, uh, years ago, I was teaching a Bible study and I had a guy in that class uh, and we, we had talked about what grace is, God's undeserved love. Uh, we had talked about what sin is, you know, our problem. We had talked about what faith is, trust in God. And then we finally got to talking about what is what are good works the things that we do because we love God. And he, and he, uh, he was a guy, he worked in a, in a big, you know, pretty heavy duty factory. Um, and he looked at me and he said, Dave, since we've started studying the Bible, I don't cuss out my, my uh, employees as much as I used to. Is that a good work? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, it is a decrease in, in a sinful behavior because you know God and you love God and, and God has changed. Yes, that is a good, that is a good work. We would love to see more progress, <laughs> but uh, um, it, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, may, maybe, maybe it's just believer day one. Uh, he, he, uh, he'll, he'll stop cutting people into pieces next week. Um, but I, I, I think you're probably, I think you're probably right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The uh, also as you uh, as we go further into uh, uh, the book of Daniel, um, we're we're not done with Nebuchadnezzar yet. He's going to reappear in our prophecy section, um, especially as he uh, he gets a pretty big wake up call from the Lord, um, a kind of rude awakening, in fact. And uh, it's it's kind of an interesting story, one that one that uh, you don't hear quite as often as uh, fiery furnace and. Um, uh, Lions. Lions Den. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, you, you're probably right there, Ken. You're probably right. You too, Tony. Um, number ten, last one. Uh, how would you? How would the principle "Give God glory" guide your decisions in the following situations? Uh, you know, one, two, three, and four. Number one, the office office atheist is on his soapbox. Um, number two, sharing your faith doesn't seem to be working. Uh, number three, the kids would rather sleep in this morning. Uh, number four, the kind of blanket, uh, that topic is only going to cause trouble, whatever that topic may be. So um, doesn't have to, we don't have to talk one, to, one through four. We don't have to talk about all of them. We don't have to talk about any of them. But if something interests you or you go, huh, what, how do I give God glory in that situation? Or you have an, uh, have an opinion, share I can totally do the Jeopardy theme. And we, we don't, like I said, we don't have to, if you don't want to. Um, I think my goal in all of these um, is to just to stop and make yourself think, am I in a situation like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where there is one answer and it is clear? Or am I in a situation where I need to stop and go, do I really need to be a part of this conversation or do I really need to be part of this situation? Um, yeah, the first one, for example, the office office atheist is on his soapbox. Am I going to bring God glory by getting into a big old argument in front of my, all my coworkers uh, with this person? I would say the chances of, are probably slim of bringing God glory in that situation. Uh, I tried it a couple of times. Didn't work out for me. Maybe if you've tried it and it worked out for you, yeah, great. But um, getting into arguments with people for the sake of getting into arguments with people, not seeing how that glorifies God too much, right? Um, 
similar with number four. Sometimes the, the topic causing trouble. Well, sometimes, yeah. That's what we're going to get to do today. <laughs> because um, sometimes a topic has to come up. Uh, but it doesn't have to every time. Um, the kids would rather sleep in this morning. Yeah, call me black and white, but that one, um, the bed's rolling over. Uh, um, um, yeah, that, that, that would be one where I'm like, no. Nah. Uh, but eventually they're not kids anymore, are they? Um, and then, and then am I, am I going to, am I going to roll the bed over um, of my, I don't know, 25 year old kid? Um, <laughs> probably not. Right. So. In, in all of these things, it, it takes a, a heart of wisdom and a, and a heart of patience to go, my, my number one goal is bring God glory. Um, and, I, and I think that can be helpful to us as we, yeah. Because I, I don't know about you, but one of the things that immediately goes through my head whenever there's a difficult decision to make is, how is this going to work out? One of the first things that comes into my head. And that's really silly. Because I don't know how it's going to work out. I can't predict how it's going to work out. And I can't control how it's going to work out. But I can ask myself, will the decision I make bring glory to my God right now? Is this, am I doing something where I will, I will represent him well? Well, if I'm going to do something that will represent him well, then I can trust him to work it out because he is the God of providence and I am just the guy standing here in this moment with a choice to make. Um, I'd rather be the guy who stands here and makes a choice than the one who has to make everything work out because I just can't. <laughs> uh, let me see. I think Oh, yeah, we can do that quick. Um, as Christians, our highest goal is to give God glory. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that nothing but a bold stand could bring God glory in their situation, so they took their stand trusting in their God. Living life to, living life to give God glory always requires trust. As that principle guides our thoughts, words, and actions, we place ourselves in God's loving hands. He protected and prospered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He can do the same for us. He had heaven waiting for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he has heaven waiting for us. Um, I, I am thankful that uh, I know that God's ultimate provision, the, the thing that he is ultimately going to work out more than anything else, is, uh, is me being with him, is you being with him. Um, everything in between that is, between now and that is just a little stuff anyway. Um, so... Uh, gives me gives me the courage I need day to day to to follow to do when I have the opportunity to do or not do. <laughs> I get in just as much trouble by doing as I do by not doing and not doing as I do by doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, any other thoughts about this one, or should we close with a brief prayer? Lord our God, uh, you. <laughs> you are the only one who can work things out. And um, and you, you place us in situations and we have the great privilege of simply bringing you glory, of representing you well. Forgive us for the times that we have crumbled and, and represented you poorly. Um, and, and we ask you, give us opportunities to try again, not for our sake, but for yours, so that that even in our failings, you can be known as the God who gives second, third, fourth, fifth chances because you are the God who forgives. Um, God, be glorified in our successes, be glorified in our failures, be glorified in all things because you are truly worthy of You've loved us that much. Amen. Yeah. Thank you all. I'll uh, I'll you. see you next week, if not sooner.
Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.